Hi everybody, welcome to The Break with PIA. Um, today we are gonna be discussing the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. In particular, we're gonna be discussing the paid family leave, both on the federal level and the state level. Um, I am, once again, Brad Latchett. I am the Director of Governance and Industry Affairs for PIA. This is my colleague, Claire Irvin. Say hi, Claire. Hi everyone, I'm Claire, I'm the Government Affairs Council. All right, Claire, let's get right into it. Paid family leave. Yep. So um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was the second federal bill um, responding to coronavirus. It was not the um, big stimulus package, which is called the CARES Act. It got a much less interesting acronym of FFCRA. Um, and I'm falling it, asleep already but with that acronym. They need to work on that. I'm glad, yeah, they need to step it up. But they, <laughs> part of the... Um, this bill passed on March, was signed into law on March 18, 2020, and one of the key, key provisions that applies to businesses, particularly small businesses with 500 or fewer employees, is the paid, paid, family, medic, paid family medical leave provision that goes into effect on Wednesday, April 1st. So this is the leave funded by, a federal, by the federal government via payroll tax credit for people to take paid time off due to uh, COVID-19 related uh, illness themselves quarantine or to care for children or other family members, particularly children who no longer are going to school due to COVID-19 related closures. Um, it also, it protects people's jobs when they are on the leave and it really only, it applies when employees are unable to go to work and are also unable to do, to telework. So as you can probably tell from the, our video feeds, Brad and I are both teleworking. So this is, uh, this means that we're, less likely to be eligible for this leave. And so it's only a short-term program. It's extended through um, December, 2020. It doesn't apply after in 2021. So um, to get into it, we'll just cover the reasons why people may take time off under this leave. The first is if they're subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation um, order related to COVID-19. So the orders coming down from the governor's offices would apply here. Um, also, any healthcare provider who advises self-quarantine, so if that's someone's doctor advises that they self-quarantine, they would also be eligible for this leave. Um, if they are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and are seeking a medical diagnosis, we've been all been reading about the backlogs in testing and the difficulties even seeing a doctor. So this, they would still be eligible even without the doc having seen a doctor or a state order. They are, people are also eligible to take leave if they're caring for an individual in mandatory or advised quarantine, or if they're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed, or whose child care provider is otherwise unavailable for COVID-19 related reasons. So if you're someone who relies on a grandparent for child care and suddenly you're unable to have your, have your parent around your child, that would still qualify, that would likely qualify under this because that your child care provider is unavailable due to their, the, um, precautions they're taking due to COVID-19. There's also room for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to um, consider to really advising um, information for additional reasons that are substantially similar to this in consultation with the Secretaries of the Treasury and la uh, Labor. So while the, those are all the reasons people could take leave, the amount of time they can take varies based on the reasons. So if, they're take, if an employee is taking pay, uh, paid sick leave or paid medical leave for their own medical treatment, which is either the government issued quarantine, the healthcare provider um, requested self-quarantining, or because they're experiencing symptoms, the employee may take two weeks or up to 80 hours for a full-time employee of paid sick leave at their regular rate of pay um, when they're unable to work because they're quarantined and or experiencing COVID-19 related symptoms. And again, this doesn't apply if an employee is quarantined, but they're capable of tel teleworking during that time. Um, the quarantine may be at the federal, state, or local government um, order, as, of, as we said, a similar healthcare provider, or simply because they are experiencing symptoms. If it's paid family leave, or they're taking the leave to care for a member of their family, who is under quarantine or experiencing COVID-19 related symptoms. The employee may, um, may receive two weeks or up to 80 hours for a full-time employee of um, paid leave at two thirds of their regular rate of pay. Um, so that's not as much 
as they would receive for their own for their own illness, but it's still a substantial portion of their income. And an additional 10 weeks of paid leave at two thirds of the regular pay rate of pay is available where an employee is unable to work due to the need to care for a child. Um, this, so this would extend that, care, that leave for 12 weeks. So if you're at home caring for a child, um, you can receive up to 12 weeks of pay, 12 weeks of pay at um, two thirds of your regular salary or income. So who, all employees are eligible for leave for the two weeks of paid sick time for COVID-19 related reasons. It's similarly, they're, all employees are eligible for the two weeks of paid family leave. Um, doesn't matter if they started a week before the COVID-19 crisis hit. It doesn't even matter if they started last week. They're still eligible for this week, this leave. Um, in order to qualify for the additional 10 weeks of paid leave, though, employees must have been employed for at least 30 days to be eligible. So this still isn't, they don't have to have had a substantial work history with um, their employer. There are some exceptions to the FFCRA paid leave. Um, again, if they're able to work remotely, um, continuing their job, and this is a big one. It's employers with 500 or more employees are exempt. It's baffling as that sounds. Um, and we'll get to we'll get to why after the details of the law. But then there's employers with fewer than 50 employees may qualify for an exemption um, to provide the paid child care leave, the additional 10 weeks but only if the requirements would jeopardize the viability of their business during that time period. So it's very, it's very limited, it's very case by case, and it's only, they must effectively prove that they must be exempt. So to calculate the rate of pay, full-time employees are eligible for 80 hours of paid leave. So if they're paid, on the, paid hourly and they're full-time, it's just 80 hours. Um, for part-time employees, they're still eligible for paid leave, and it's based on the number of hours they would ordinarily work over a two week period. Um, the amount people are paid is, is capped per day. Um, it's $511 for paid, for paid sick leave, where they would be paid 100% of, of their daily wage. And then for that, it's $5,110 in the aggregate. Um, if they're taking, taking the leave to pay, care for a family member or child, it's capped at $200 a day or $1,000 a week, um, totaling $2,000 for the two week leave and $12,000 in aggregate for the 12 week leave. And that's for the, where they're getting two thirds of their regular pay. Employers cannot require that employees exhaust other paid time off before taking the FFCRA paid leave. In fact, the FFCRA paid leave comes before any other paid leave. So employees who've accumulated employer, the pay, um, paid time off based on the employer's plans, cannot be required to use that before accessing the federal leave. Similarly, the employer can't require employees take other state leave programs that we'll touch on at the end before taking this time off. Paid leave, the federal paid leave program comes before all other paid leave, whether it's from the employer or states or cities. Um, ultimately though, the federal government will be paying for this leave all covered employers will qualify for a dollar to dollar reimbursement through a tax credit on all qualifying wages. Um, the tax credits extend to amounts paid or incurred um, to maintain health insurance and uh, health insurance. So all the health insurance, so the amount you typically, employer typically would pay for the health insurance is still subject to get, it's subject to the reimbursement as well. Um, there's also no payroll tax liability and self-employed, employer, employed individuals may also receive the equivalent credit for their income for these reasons. Uh, in order to obtain the federal tax credit, eligible employees um, will pay, pay the leave, are able to pay the leave through the amount of payroll taxes that they typically would deposit with the IRS. So normally an employer collects payroll taxes, federal taxes on payroll, and then deposits it with the IRS. That money can now be used to cover some of these expenses. Um, it's that money also includes the employee and employer shares of Social Security and Medicare expenses. And if that funds, those funds are not sufficient to cover the cost, an employer will be eligible to request an accelerated payment for the IRS. So PI will be posting links to the IRS pages that will have more information and have more guides on how, how the tax side of this all works. The main purpose is that employers the goal is to get employers the funds as quick as possible to cover these costs. 
Um, employer, the cover period again is through the end of December 2020s and starts April 1st. It does not extend into 2021 or beyond. It's not creating a long-term program, it's just for the COVID-19 related crisis. And as I mentioned, as I mentioned um, earlier, met states also may have their own programs um, and employers cannot require employees use it before the federal program. So just to quickly touch upon what states have, Connecticut, um, Connecticut requires employers with 50 or more employees to provide one hour paid leave for every hour of work, capped at 40 hours, 40 hours a year or five days. Um, New Jersey is very sim New Jersey similar, but for employers of all sizes, um, and also capped at forty dollars a year. Um, New York signed their paid sick leave into law the exact same day as the federal program, so it's fairly new and um, applies to employers with ten or more employees and or a net income above one million dollars. And it's um, the leave increases for employers with over a hundred or more employees. New York City also requires employees earn at least one hour paid sick leave for every 30 hours worked up to 40 hours and that's an existing program. Um, to know more about New York, I'd recommend looking at our resources specifically on the New York paid sick leave. And then Vermont, um, as of 2019, requires employers with five or more employees to provide 40 hours of paid leave and allows it to be accrued on an hourly on one hour for every 52 hours worked basis. So again, any leave of employees have accumulated under that comes after the federal paid leave program. And resources about that are, um, are posted on the PI, PI Resource Center. So now we'll have a couple quick brief discussion on some of the more finer facts. Um, now that you've gotten the essentials, you can, if you're in a rush, turn it off, but I assume you all wanna listen to Brad and I talk about it more. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, so first, before we get into really the, the, the details of this, let's talk about the scope. So this, these laws from both the federal and state are pretty all encompassing mm -hmm. in one regard, right? They um, include a lot of employees. And the reason they do that is because this didn't exist before COVID-19 in a lot of states. Yes. As you mentioned, some states did have paid sick leave, like New Jersey and Connecticut. Others like New York did not. And certainly federally, we didn't have any of these programs at all. Um, so they were needed in order to provide uh, a service, if you will, that didn't otherwise exist. That said, mm -hmm. the scope is limited in the amount of time. You indicated that the program only runs through the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not going to be a evergreen sort of program. Although I guess we'll see when, um, when December rolls around if, if any of these states or the federal government does renew these um, in general, because a lot of other countries do have similar laws in place not related to COVID. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's as far as the uh, COVID-19 related responses, it's probably one of the longest extended programs. A lot of the programs, particularly those in the stimulus package um, signed last week, only go through the end of June. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the longest lasting one uh, by comparison, but it will be interesting to see what happens in December, uh, when December rolls around. Yeah. Um, so you teased towards the beginning, the employers with over 500 employees. What happens with those individuals or those businesses? So, so the, main, the goal of the drafters of the bill in Congress was to require those large employers, so those with 500 or more employees, to pay it themselves. This program is the federal government paying for the leave, and they wanted to make sure it was a benefit for small businesses, not massive corporations. However, when they were drafting the bill, they didn't actually require large corporations provide paid sick leave. So that's why employers for a business such as Amazon, employees for a business such as Amazon, aren't able to access the leave that a small business down the street from my from my home now has to provide. Seems Which, a bit of an oversight there. Just a little bit. Those employers do um, are still subject to all the state rules, state requirements. So the employees for those businesses would still get the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York City paid sick leave. They just don't get the federal benefit. It's good to know. Uh, so question and clarification. Um, during uh, when we were talking about the paid leave, you mentioned that employees who uh, are unable to remote could be eligible for paid leave. In addition, you also mentioned that employees who are under a quarantine by the state, so for example, New York, which has ordered a 100% workforce reduction for non-essential businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so if an employee was unable to remote and forced to stay at home, I guess, would they be eligible for leave? 
I think we're still waiting to see exactly how it plays out in terms of how the state orders for non-essential employees to go home and how their inability to work actually will affect things like programs like this. But in theory, they should be able to at least apply for this type of leave because the state's preventing them from going to work and they might have a job that is entirely based in the office and be, or a, bit, a retail establishment or other location that you can't just bring home. You can't just get forward all package and mail to someone's apartment. It's, you have to kind of be there to receive packages, to do printing, to do, all, to do a lot of things that I think we don't really realize can't be done remotely. I think we're very quickly realizing what we can and cannot do remotely. Yes. Um, last thing from me here is I want to mention uh, the employees on the federal level, I'm sorry, employers who have 50 or fewer employees. You mentioned mm -hmm. that they could um, apply for basically a hardship um, exemption to this law. Um, they need, they do, do, you need, do you need to be proactive about this, right? They're not just granted. Mm -hmm. They need to go out and, and seek permission to um, be exempt. Yes, you need to see. They need to seek out um, the permission. If you if you are a business and you can look at your payroll and know that you will not be able to cover this and you have less than fifty employees, it's better to be proactive and just get that ahead before it becomes an issue. Um, I will also add that there's a lot of talk. I'm sure everyone's heard. And we've been putting out a lot of information about the SBA um, pay, Paycheck Protection Program. Those um, the paid sick leave under this doesn't qualify as a payroll expense on this. But the idea is the federal government is paying for their will eventually be paying for the payroll this way and the government's trying to make sure those payments are getting out also as soon as possible so that by the time june rolls around and those are being looked at closer closer it shouldn't be an issue that's just something to keep in mind when you're uh exploring if you're a business exploring all of your options under these new federal programs perfect all right. Well, thank you, Claire, for explaining paid family leave to us. I know we've gotten a lot of questions about this, both in the federal program and the state program. Um, so it certainly is helpful. Um, as you just put up the um, information portion here. And if you have any questions, um, not you, Claire, those watching us, because Claire, you can email me if you have any questions. If you have any questions, please send them to Claire and myself or the Resource Center. Um, we will be having a special edition of the break answering all questions for all of the um, segments that we do put out. Appreciate everybody watching. Um, look for further postings from us on different topics going forward uh, through this week into next. And hopefully everybody is staying home and staying safe. Thank you. Thanks everyone.